Welcome to everyone that has joined us this morning. We are on our journey across Australia. Um, and uh, this is part three of our incredible rail journey series. Um, welcome everyone, welcome Mary, um, who's just joined us as well. And I see a bunch of other names popping on. So welcome to everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us. And we will get started without further ado. Uh, I see uh, a bunch of names that uh, are a bunch of people who are new to us. So I'll give you the brief overview for the rest of you, just to have an extra sip of wine. While, um, <clears throat> Wheel and Anchor is all about bringing travelers together. So I started this community a few years ago, um, having spent 30 years in the business of selling travel uh, to people from all across Canada. And the thing that I, what I found uh, and my, my reason for setting up Wheel and Anchor was because when people get together who know each other, whether they're friends or just, you know, acquaintances, um, and there's a, a like-mindedness that makes the travel experience so much better, so much more um, exciting and fulfilling. And so that is really our mission behind Wheel and Anchor is to have great people travel to great places. And, uh, and we just have a lot of fun along the way. My personal goal for everyone at Wheel and Anchor is uh, to become well-traveled and well-connected. And, um, and as I always say, but I'll keep saying it, um, well-traveled is more than about ticking off items off, uh, off of your bucket list, which is not to say that that's not valid, but let's face it, you know, so, so much of travel um, up till now has been about, you know, seeing as much as you can in as little a period of time. And our view, my view is, let's take a little bit more time and maybe see less, but by seeing less, we see more. And that's what makes you um, well-traveled and connected to the people that you meet along the way, uh, as, well, as well as the people that you, you travel with. And I know a great number of friendships have been fostered um, through the trips that we've uh, offered in our short lifespan here at, uh, at Wheel and Anchor so far. Uh, so joining us on our webinar this morning, my name's Gordon. I'm the founder of Wheel and Anchor. I think I know uh, um, the majority of you on the webinar this morning. I'm joined by Joel Curry, who is uh, my co-founder, partner in crime, and uh, provides technical support. Paula Zarnick is sitting in uh, her office uh, over in uh, outside of Ottawa. And um, our special guest this morning, uh, this evening, I'm going to say it again, <laughs> our special guest this evening is uh, Mark Leopold uh, from Journeys Beyond in Australia. So coming all the way from, you're in Adelaide, is that right, Mark? Yeah, that's right. Adelaide. Yep. Not far so from the from, uh, great wineries that you were talking about. <laughs> exactly. That's that's where they all are. So we're, we want to go and visit Mark uh, in uh, in Adelaide, Australia. That's where that's where, as, as, as Mark just said, all these great wineries are. And he is an expert on uh, these trains uh, in Australia. And so he's going to uh, do most of the talking and let us know about what we can expect in Australia. Um, so first of all, why train travel? And, you know, it's really been interesting. We've continued this series on rail journeys because I found uh, an inordinately high amount of interest. And I think that, you know, uh, there's a lot of controversy, controversy, excuse me, in the cruise business these days, um, uh, you know, given COVID-19 and all the rest of it. And, and, but I think coupled with that is that, that, you know, cruising, river cruising in particular, um, which is still a wonderful way to travel, has sort of seen its heyday. And while I'm sure it will remain popular, and there's a lot of benefits to it. I think that um, my sense is that people are looking for the next thing. Uh, and there are so many great rail journeys around the world. We've seen Trans-Siberian. We had a trip that was sold out earlier this year that, of course, we had to move to next year. I know some of you were actually booked on that trip. Um, and uh, our last couple of webinars, we had great feedback. Um, people are really interested to see the world by train. Um, so uh, that's, I think, why we are putting a little bit of a focus onto rail journeys, because our members have spoken, and that's the type of thing that you're interested in. Uh, for those of you who didn't participate in our last over, uh, uh, webinars, just a quick overview of what we've done so far. We talked about the Silk Road Orient Express, um, which is up in the Stan countries uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and so on. Uh, we spoke about uh, the Al Andalus, which is a deluxe train in Spain uh, that travels from the Mediterranean up to the Atlantic coast in Galicia. Uh, we, we talked obviously about the Trans-Siberian, which is the longest rail journey in the world that goes from Moscow to Beijing. Um, that's a trip that we are actually going on next September. 
Uh, and then in part two of our series, we talked about a couple of Robo's journeys in, in Africa, um, particularly the trip from Cape Town, uh, South Africa, up to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And we also talked about the so-called Copper Trail, um, which is the route that starts in Angola on the Atlantic Ocean and crosses through that country as well as the Congo uh, and Zambia and ends up at Victoria Falls. Replays for those webinars uh, you can find in our newsletters or of course on our website um, or, or on our YouTube channel. So if you missed any of those and you're interested, um, then please do check them out uh, and uh, let, let us have your feedback. But today it's all about Australia. And so looking at the map of Australia, we can see that um, Journeys Beyond Rail is, which is a, the company that Mark is with that um, offers these trips, uh, are uh, cover really sort of the whole part of the country, or at least from north to south and east to west. Mark, give us a, a bit of a history about sort of rail in general in Australia and how these uh, amazing luxury journeys came to be. Yeah, well, I guess... Australia is a, a relatively young country in, in Western terms, quite old in, um, in terms of our in, Indigenous history, but um, the GAN line itself uh, follows the original telegraph route between Adelaide and Darwin, and then that eventually connected through to, um, through to London. And Adelaide was actually the first, uh, the first um, city in the world that was connected by telegraph to, um, to London. So that's a little bit of interesting trivia there. But mm -hmm. the... Um, the original route um, was initially travelled by Afghan cameleers. Um, obviously, it goes through some quite harsh desert um, desert country, so camels were the logical choice to um, take supplies through to Alice Springs, which was um, originally founded as uh, as a key point on the on the telegraph line. And then eventually, once the, the I guess the um, interior developed enough. To sustain a rail line, then the GAN route um, was originally uh, was built following that uh, that telegraph line, partly to to help service the telegraph line, keep it up and running, partly to, to make sure that supplies could get through to Alice Springs and and then up to Darwin, which would have been the closest port to um, to a lot of the Asian markets as well. And I guess that's where the the GAN takes its uh, takes its name from as well, from the uh, from the original Afghan cameleers that um, that trod that route. And you were mentioning a statistic, which I had not heard before, that uh, Australia, was it you that mentioned it to me? Australia, no, it was another friend of mine from Australia. Australia has more camels than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> that is actually correct. We, uh, we do export them to the Middle East. <laughs> so here, here's a, an interesting factoid for the for the evening is uh, Australia sends camels to the Middle East, one of one of the many ex exports of Australia. Um, and of course, the Indian Pacific is is the east west route between um, Sydney via Adelaide and and, uh, and on to Perth. Uh, That's and, and yep. what what how, how did that one sort of come to be? I mean, I know in Canada, our Canadian, uh, which was uh, CP rail at the time was really what what pulled the country together from from east to west but it's a different story in australia yeah so the i guess the gan well the gan actually celebrated its 90th birthday last year so that's um got quite a bit of mm. history and the and the route's got quite a bit of history the the indian pacific uh we celebrated its 50th birthday back in february but because of the um i guess the country that it travels through and again the the nullarbor plain is um is a really harsh desert environment and called Nullarbor because there's, there's no trees. It's a, it's a Latin name for it. So I guess traveling um, across to, from, from Sydney over to Perth was, would typically have been done by, by boat or by plane when that became uh, available. So it took, um, and because of the, the harsh environment, it took quite a while before a, uh, a rail link was established between east and west. And again, it was primarily developed um, as, a, as a freight route and then um, built up into a uh, into a passenger service as well in the back in the 1970s. And it really covers some amazing varying countryside. We'll take a look at that in a second, but I think that's what the appeal is um, of these rail journeys. And I guess why travel by rail by, um, you know, as, as is offered by your company has become so, um, so popular. So this morning, yeah. this evening, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at the GAN, uh, which as uh, Mark just pointed out, goes between Darwin in the north and Adelaide in the south, as well as the Indian Pacific, um, which is east to west. And it'll give a sense, give us a sense about 
um, what rail travel in Australia is all about. So let's start with the trains, Mark. Um, so I understand that the, the, the configuration of the trains, whether you're on the GAN or the Indian Pacific or on uh, the Great Southern Route, which was the other one we didn't mention, um, are similar. And so maybe you can give us an overview about what, what are the trains like? What does it feel like on board? How does a, what does a typical day look like? Yeah, so yeah, that, that's correct, Gordon. The all of the trains are pretty much identical on the on the inside, so it doesn't matter which one you travel on, you'll always um, get a similar level of service and, uh, and quality on board. Um, so that picture that you can see there is one of our uh, gold service twin cabins. We've only got the two levels of service there, so gold. Um, yeah, we have the upper and lower lower berths, and then the, the private bathroom facilities. And I think there's a picture of that a little bit later. But, um, but typically the, the trains are uh, made up of, I guess, four to five gold service carriages. And then we have a lounge car and a, and a dining car, which services that, that group of people. And here you can see one of the, uh, one of the bathrooms. So this is actually a, a, a self-contained unit. So you can see the toilet sort of vanity there. And there's also a shower in there. So each of the, um, each of the twin cabins have got their own private facilities on board. So it's a huge plus, I think, Mark. We were talking about this yesterday. Is uh, some of the train journeys that are offered, even like the most famous in the world, like the Orient Express, don't even have, uh, have bathrooms available on board. Uh, on, certainly, private, no private uh, facilities on board. So the fact that everybody gets their own facilities is certainly, I think, an appeal for our members. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, a very nice feature to have. Yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely one of the uh, the the key selling points, I guess, for us. That a lot of people do like to have those uh, those private uh, those private facilities. And definitely, a lot of people do comment on that because it is uh, it is a little bit different to some of the other great rail journeys around the world. Indeed, so. indeed. And so the so here we we have a look at the lounge car, and so this is again something that's a bit different from some other journeys is that you have. Um, a few different spaces where you can spend the day while you're riding the rails, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, so this lounge right. car, yeah. What goes on in the lounge car? What's what? What do you? What, what does it feel like to be there? Yeah. So I guess, um, and for the, for for those people who have online who have been to Australia, they um, they probably understand that Australians are quite relaxed in in nature. Um, and I guess traveling on the trains in Australia is also quite relaxed. So we don't specifically have a, have a dress code. And as you can see here, most of the people are, are wearing just, uh, just neat, casual, comfortable clothes on board. So, and, and it's the same in the dining cars. We don't expect people to get dressed up for, um, for meal services or, or anything like that. But typically most people would spend their time on the train either between the cabins and um, the lounge car and then the meal service in the uh, in the Queen Adelaide dining car and you can see uh, some of the, the food that we offer here on the on the screen at the moment. So, the food looks fantastic um, uh, like really top quality um, um, dishes. It's, it's definitely one of the things that people comment on the most is that they're um, <laughs> We, we like to think that we don't surprise people, but, but people always say, oh, I was so surprised about how good the food and wine was on board the train. It was, uh, it was, it's really one of the, the highlights of the, of the trip for a lot of people. Exactly. So we can, we can call it a culinary uh, uh, journey as well, not just... Uh... <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And so and that's one of the key points for us. It's really about providing a, a, a full experience for, for all of our guests and it's not, not just showcasing the destination, but also the... The, the food, the wine, and the and the people, so the guests can get real a real good sense of uh, the people and the place that they're they're travelling through. And and so and and the meals are all served table service, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, you're you're served. Yeah, that's your correct. Yeah. Yep. So in the in breakfast is a little bit more um, a, bit, a little bit more informal. So we typically do breakfast cooked to order. And then lunches will typically be a two course lunch with a, um, a main course and a dessert. And then dinner would typically be a three course dinner with an entree and main and, and dessert as part of it. And then um, as part of the fairs, all the drinks are included as well. So beer, wine, spirits, um, cocktails, whatever anyone wants to drink, um, it's, it's all part of the... Uh, I was about to say that's uh, that's uh, that 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 makes it a very uh, sort of value packed uh, proposition when you have uh, all the drinks included. So um, I guess as you're 
you know, watching the scenery go by, you know, more than a few travelers uh, have, have um, yeah, certainly. Oh, I'm yes. sure about uh, yeah, it, a lot of our, a lot of our guests like to sit back and, uh, and have a, have a drink while they're watching the, uh, watching the scenery go past or trying to spot the kangaroos and emus out the window. <laughs> and I guess you see all manner of wildlife. Uh, we have kangaroos in particular and uh, yeah, emus yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, we um, even in the middle of the desert, uh, it's uh, it's quite common to to see an animal. And I remember last time I was on the I was in the Indian Pacific, we were going across an animal. So there's no trees or anything for for quite a distance. And then suddenly you go past a, a random camel just sitting there. It's like, where did that come from? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so um, Fran asked a question about cabins with double beds. Actually, we should uh, we should point that out. Actually, there are two other sort of types of cabins. Uh, there are um, gold single cabins, right? So you have yeah. cabins in gold class that are designed for single travelers. And correct. You, yes. I think you were saying you in that case, you share a bathroom with the neighboring cabin. That, um, that's correct. There, um, so in the with the singles, um, single cabins, we have um, shower facilities at the end of the end of the carriage, so that all the all the single carriage um, cabins in that section will share the um, will share the, the showers and the and the bath and the toilets in that section. And then, I guess, in terms of double beds, we have we have a, a small number of what we term superior cabins on there, which has got it's it's just a little bit smaller than a standard double bed. And then there's a fold down um, single bunk as well in that one. So um, really, I guess, ideal for, for two adults and a, and a child. And then we have our premium level service, which is our platinum service, which we have um, right. double beds in, as part of. Right, so so uh, that's a good point. We didn't mention that, but there is a so-called platinum class in addition to the gold service. And um, platinum service, uh, the cabins again, the compartments are a little bit larger, and you say those are offered with uh, double beds as well. Yeah, double beds, and then they get a, a slightly, they get a larger ensuite bathroom facilities as well. Larger ensuite bathroom, and they also have a special lounge car for uh, platinum. Yes. Um, yeah, they're in their own. Um, they're they're all in their own section of the of the train. Um, platinum service guests so we um, we do split the train up into uh, into gold and platinum and typically most people they they would stay in the in the section of their train where they where their cabin is right exactly so um, so in terms of uh, if wheel and anchor was traveling as a group I mean I think, we, I think we'd see we'd probably have some people that would prefer to travel in in platinum class but we'd we'd work it out so that we were still able to intermingle and of course at all the stops along the way um, you know as as usual we can we yeah can exactly travel when, once you get off the train then uh, everyone uh, everyone mixes in in together and and these wonderful sunset dinners and sunrise breakfasts that you have uh, um, yeah, we can definitely all exactly. Next. Yeah, perfect. Good. Um, so uh, certainly, if anybody has any other questions about the train, we're going to go on and talk a little bit about the itineraries. Uh, first of all, starting with the GAN, uh, and we're um, as we've typically done with these we webinars is that we're going to talk about sort of the full journey on on each of these two uh, epic trips. Uh, and uh, these may or may not reflect what we actually would offer with Wheel and Anchor. We're just sort of contemplating how we would put together a trip across Australia to see sort of as much as possible, but at the same time retain our usual pace that is um, not too rushed. So, so let's start with the GAN. Um, as you mentioned, um, this goes, uh, the, the, the history of this is back to the, uh, the, the Afghans who, who helped settle the, the interior um, on, on their camels. Um, 3,000 kilometers almost from, from Adelaide um, up to uh, Darwin. And uh, so starting from, starting from the south, from, from your home there of, of Adelaide, um, tell us a few highlights. I mean, not too much of us know about Adelaide. I mean, we, we might know that that is, of course, wine country. Um, but um, what's, what's special about Adelaide as a, as a city? Yeah, so Adelaide's a, um, Adelaide's a great place and uh, I've always always loved living here. I um, I did actually live in Canada for nearly a year, so I do have a, a strong affinity for, for Canada, but um, but Adelaide's always been home and it's a, it's a, it's a great place to live where uh, it's about nearly 1.5 million people. So it's it's small in global terms, but it's it's big, um, big enough to have all the facilities that you want. Um, it's really easy to, to get around. 
Um, and I guess some of the best parts of living in Adelaide is the proximity to a lot of the wine regions. So the Barossa, you're only 45 minutes sort of being up the road. Um, Adelaide Hills has got some amazing wine region. And then it's, I mean, I love getting out and, and experiencing nature and wildlife and, um, and you don't have to travel very far to get, um, to get out into, into the bush. And in fact, where I live, I've, I've actually seen, and I know this sounds like a, um, like a real cliche, but I've actually seen kangaroos hopping down my street on a couple of occasions. Um, I do live quite close to bushland, but, uh, but even so, we used to get koalas in our trees and um, lots of birds. And so it's just a, it's just a really great, um, great lifestyle and, uh, and place to live for those sorts of, those sorts of reasons. That's that's remarkable. Um, let's talk for a second about Barossa Valley and 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 the wine region. As you say, this is basically at your doorstep. Some of the best um, yeah. wines in the world, and uh, certainly, yeah. Sorry, you're lucky. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. And, and, and everything, I mean, all these, these wine regions are accessible in pretty much a day trip from, from Adelaide. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. In fact, yeah, you can, from my house, I can actually travel through, through a uh, wine region to get to the Barossa Valley. So um, you can't oh, wow. go too far without, uh, without coming across a, a, across a, a really good winery here in, uh, here in Adelaide. But, um, but the Barossa is obviously from a from a global point of view, one of the best known, and I guess we we feature a lot of their the Barossa wines on our on our trains. Because from a food and beverage point of view, we really want to to showcase the the regions that we that we travel through in terms of the um, the produce and the, and the food and beverages that we that we use. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So so our train departs Adelaide uh, and uh, heads up north. And I guess relatively quickly, you, you leave sort of the green southern coastal area and you come up yeah. um, into, first of all, through the Flinders Ranges, um, and which, which is sort of the, the taste of the outback already, even though we're gonna be traveling through it for most of the journey. Yeah, that's right. Um, and someone mentioned it, or maybe you mentioned it right at the start that um, Australia it, is a big country, but it's also very diverse and I guess the, um, traveling by train you really get to see a lot of that diversity so starting in Adelaide you're, you're in the rich farmlands and the and the wine regions and then you, when you come out of Adelaide you, you you see the landscape slowly transform into the into the outback um, landscapes and the, the Flinders Ranges is really the first part of that and then the route of the uh, that the GAN follows actually um, through, uh, I guess parallels the the Flinders Ranges for, for quite a way so you get some uh, fantastic landscapes out there out the window as you're starting that journey. So you start with some um, beautiful mountains and then uh, I guess the territory then flattens out um, as, it, we, it as we- It does indeed, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's, and like most of the interior of Australia, but um, you know, we head up and I guess one of our first stops is a little town called Marla and um, which yeah. I guess like many of these little outposts in the middle of Australia, there is not a lot there. <laughs> no, in fact, um, <laughs> Marla and um, there, there's probably only about ten or twelve people that might uh, that might live there. It's a pretty small it's a pretty small place, and uh, and I guess when we get there, it's it's actually just before sunrise. So we um, we offer a sunrise breakfast stop, so people can get off the off the train, stretch their legs, and and watch a, a magnificent uh, sunrise from, uh, from over the desert. And I guess the just like you see in the picture, the rocks light up in this beautiful shade of red. Yeah, the the colours really start coming to life uh, with the with that early morning light. It's really a magical time to be to be out there. Fantastic. So, um, and then as that day progresses, so so we spend one night on the train to get to Alice Springs, which is of course pretty much in the geographical centre of Australia, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it it's very close to it. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, after after Marley, we get um, everyone gets back on the train, and then um, we settle in. We have uh, we have we have lunch, and then uh, sort of early mid afternoon, we arrive in in Alice Springs, which, as Gordon said, uh, centre of Australia, and again, it's a it's a real little uh, I guess outpost uh, in the terms of uh, in terms of Australia. There's there's not a lot surrounding Alice Springs in terms of in terms of towns. Um, but uh, it's got some pretty spectacular sceneries, and as you can see from this picture here, you've got the uh, you've got the McDonald Ranges surrounding the town. You've got um, a river which is dry for for most of the time, uh, running through it. But there are permanent water holes in the in the area, 
And then once again, we get all of the guests off the train and we offer a choice of uh, a few different tours to either um, experience the wildlife of the area or the um, some of the, the natural scenery and indigenous culture or um, a bit of the town history. And um, I guess Australian, how Australians and experience how Australians live in these, uh, in these remote places. In these, in these remote places. And so Alice Springs can be one of the get off or get on uh, points on the train. In fact, uh, one of our yeah, members, correct. Mary, mentioned that she did the GAN from Darwin to Alice Springs. Uh, and so, uh, so this is one of the points that we could join or leave. Uh, and uh, here it's not far away to get to uh, um, Uluru, for, uh, formerly known as Ayers Rock. Uh, and yep, that's uh, correct. Um, uh, you know, as you pointed out, uh, Fran asked the question about the, the tours. Um, all of the tours on the trip are included, uh, with the exception of a couple of, of, of uh, special upgrade tours, uh, uh, you know, like the helicopter flight over to Uluru and so on is... Uh, yeah, uh, there, yeah, there's not many that are um, upgrades, but we do, um, even over Alice Springs, we can offer a, a, a fixed wing scenic flight over, over Alice Springs as an option, and then um, then the next stop up at Catherine, there's some helicopter flights and stuff up there as well. And then on the return journey coming back from Darwin, we do offer the um, the option of people upgrading to the scenic flight out to out to Uluru and um, and doing a bit of walk out there as part of it. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm sure there's lots of of of, of different things to see. Um, so the the train continues north up uh, through the outback, heading for the north coast of Australia. And as we approach um, Darwin, I guess, we get up into this uh, area called Catherine, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So, and again, this is a, um, a real, another, another area where you see the, uh, the landscapes changing dramatically. So you go from the, from the flat red earth of um, surrounding Alice Springs and that, that desert area, and then as you start approaching Catherine, it's, it really does start to get a lot greener. And then, you, um, and then we stop at Catherine and, and there's this magnificent gorge um, system up there called uh, Nipmalat Gorge. And we get all the guests off, uh, off in Catherine and we offer a choice of a, a few different tours out to the uh, out to Nipmalat Gorge. So here um, there's some amazing Aboriginal rock art there. So, and that's quite popular, especially with our guests from, uh, from, from Canada and I guess North America in general. Um, so people can go and do a, a, a Aboriginal rock art tour or, um, or we just offer a, a more of a, a, a standard um, gorge tour, which focuses more on the on the scenic beauty of the area, the the nature and the wildlife. Yeah, exactly, and and uh, and and obviously that's that's what it's all about up 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 here in in the north of Australia. And you mentioned Aboriginal uh, art and culture. I think that is something that that you know we are we are quite interested in in exploring. And there's lots of opportunities, um, not just here, but I think in in many of the stops along the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely uh, it's definitely um, part of our our history. So it's uh, it's it's an important part of the journey as well. Indeed. Indeed. And uh, of course, the northern terminus is Darwin, um, which is uh, way up in the in the Northern Territory that, the, as you say, the tropical part of Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So really quite different up there. Um, and, but and yes, this so is where the, uh, the journey ends. Um, so once up, up here, um, unfortunately, the, the journey has to come to an end. So typically, the, the GAN, you get two nights, three days on, on the train um, before arriving in arriving in Darwin and um, generally speaking once people get up there they'll get, they'll probably spend a, a few days exploring the local region up there as well because there's uh, it's a it really is a spectacular spectacular place to go and I, I guess up here you've got Kakadu which is probably one of the best known uh, national parks in in Australia um, it's also probably the biggest I believe as well but there's uh, it the the Aboriginal history and culture in, in this part of the country is uh, amazingly well preserved and, and quite accessible as well. So it's, re it's a really key part of a, I guess, a visit to Australia is, is going out to seeing this, um, this place. But there's also some um, amazing lodges and other experiences up there that people can, people can take in as well. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, I think there's all kinds of things that you can see. I mean, you know, uh, Darwin is sort of the, to the gateway to this very rugged north coast of Australia, and there's, uh, there's a sort of adventure cruises, and there's, there's all kinds of things that yeah. uh, 
that one can do from from Darwin, and I've certainly um, you know looked into a few of them. I mean, the options are um, as usual num numerous, but um, but that that pretty much summarizes the the GAN. Um, so the trip obviously can be done uh, from Adelaide in the south to the north to Darwin, or on in the reverse. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, we're looking at the best way to to to, to manage that to put to get put that together in a in a trip that would really be a a, a wonderful um, um, way yeah. to see all. Yeah. Really, yeah. So, so it really um, is our, um, our I guess when people talk about rain travel in uh, in Australia, then the the GAN is really kind of the iconic journey that uh, that a lot of people want to do. That, that a lot of a lot of people want to take, and so. Um, but we're going to take a look as well at the Indian Pacific, which of course uh, covers the whole country from east to west. Um, so passing through, obviously, you know, a lot of outback as well, um, but a little bit different. Um, and you know, the Indian Pacific uh, starts or ends depending on your direction of travel in Sydney. Uh, and I think um, uh, this one here, I, I found this statistic interesting as we were going through this. It's uh, there's one stretch of track that's 478 kilometers without a single bend or a curve. <laughs> yeah, the longest uh, longest stretch of straight railway in the world. It's uh, those quirky bits of trivia there. <laughs> and so, there's, there's, it, there's not a lot of reason to take um, to 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 turn when you're out in the middle of the Nullarbor. There's not a lot to hit. So, and uh, uh, I, Gene uh, may, may ask a good question about combining two or more trips on the train. In fact, Gene, that's uh, and I'll come to that at the end. So just uh, just hang on for one second because it's actually. Uh, exactly what I'm contemplating is 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 perhaps doing two two in one um, in one trip. Um, so, uh, but coming back to the Indian Pacific, so it goes like almost five thousand kilometers across the country. Um, uh, Sydney, well, it doesn't really need much introduction. I think uh, you know if we if if, uh, if our members haven't been there, they'll certainly have seen this picture of the Opera House before um, and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, Sydney is a is an absolutely magical city. Uh, I, I've only had the pleasure of traveling there once, um, and I, but I was really taken by, you know, all of the nooks and crannies because it's it's like a bay, right? This um, with all the yeah, neighborhood it's a, being it's different, a massive different harbor system that they've got there, and it's really yeah. um, it it's quite a spectacular city for those for, for those people who haven't been there. I mean, you 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 get to some of the water um, areas of the of the city, and it really is quite a quite a remarkable location. And they've got, I mean, famous places like the, the the beaches of Sydney are so well known, like Manly and 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 many many others. And so, yeah. you know, we we would certainly spend at least uh, a, a four nights there, I think, um, as we typically do in a city like this. It hardly even does it, it justice because there's there's so much to oh. see. Um, the the train heads out of Sydney, obviously um, destined for Perth in the west. And um, one of the yeah. first things you come through are these blue mountains. Uh, and you know, we we for those for those of our members that live in Ontario, we have our own little blue mountain. This is a bit of a different thing. <laughs> uh, this is so um, yeah. Uh, another I guess another quirky fact: it, it gets its name because of all the uh, the gum trees there. The um, the 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 eucalyptus have got a lot of um, oil in the leaves, and the and the vapor from the oil. When you look at it from a distance, it uh, it kind of gives the ranges a, a bluish tinge to it. So hence the name, the blue mountains. But, uh, yeah, very spectacular area, and I guess nearly everyone that goes to Sydney will, um, will at some stage do a tour up through the Blue Mountains because there's some spectacular. Parts. And so we wind our way. I guess the train winds its way through through the the, the Blue yeah. Mountains once again. This is the, sort of the green part of Australia, close to the coast. Yeah. Um, and then we break through and 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 getting into um, yeah the more. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's quite an interesting part of the journey because you go through the the mountains in the in the daytime, and then you have dinner and you go to bed, and then the next morning you wake up and you're kind of in the in the flat plains and the, and the desert. So it's um, it's a bit of a, uh, a shock to the senses, I guess, when you when you look out the window and it's completely different to when you went to bed. But yeah, we wake yeah. up um, wake <laughs> up in the in the morning. We're in Broken Hill, and uh, and we offer. a uh, a few different choices of, of tour in Breakin Hill. This one's a, a bit of a shorter stop, so we're only there for about hour and a half, two hours. Um, but the, the tours will take in sort of the, the town history. There's a really strong arts culture up in Broken Hill. So, um, so one of the tours focuses on that. One of the tours focuses um, more so on the, on the desert landscapes. Um, and then it's Broken Hill, as it says there on the site, on the, on the screens, it's a, 
got a, a very strong mining history to it. So one of the tours also takes in some of the miners' memorials and a bit of the mining history of the of the area. Yeah, terrific. And 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 so um, so most of this part of the trip is is this the outback? So this stretch here uh, as well between Sydney and Adelaide, um, or or how would you define the, the um, sort of Geological yeah, the outback is a, is, a, is a bit of a, 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 a loose or generic term, I guess, uh, anywhere that's um, that's not one of the big cities, pretty much, <laughs> or away from the coastline. So, um, so a lot of people would uh, would classify uh, Broken Hill as being part of the outback. So, the Indian Pacific, it kind of it kind of loops up through Broken Hill and the outback, then ducks back down into into Adelaide and the, and the wine regions, and then we include we actually on this journey we actually include um, some touring in the Barossa Valley, and we have dinner at a at one of the, the really um, old historic wineries in the Barossa before jumping, getting back onto the train and then continuing um, across the country. So once again, like when you leave Sydney, you're in the Blue Mountains, you go to bed, you wake up in the desert, then you do a tour in the in the Barossa and the wine country, you get back on the train, you go to bed and then you wake up and once again, you've left the, the green landscapes behind and, you, and you're back into the, into the desert landscapes when you wake up, so. Yeah. Um, the scenery on this trip really does change quite um, quite dramatically from quite a bit today. and so we stop at cook um which is i think you you were say, saying to me yesterday this is just just basically a water stop there's there's uh, like like yeah, many of these so, things not much going on yeah so we we only stop and cook it's probably about half an hour 45 minutes stop um and as you say we, we we need to take water on there but basically what you can see in that picture is it's not quite all that there. There is a there is a small township, and and two people do do live there. Um, there's some two. old historic um, um, cell blocks which are which were built back in the in the early 18, 1800s. But um, yeah, it's just a, a quirky place that you you see. I don't know there's probably fifteen or twenty houses, but um, but no one really living in them. And because it's so dry, it's, uh, everything's pretty well preserved out out there. But, it's just really a chance to get off and stretch your legs and uh, yeah and, and remarkable and just to witness again the the vastness of the territory and you know mm. as we continue on um we we come to this place at uh Rolina, um which uh you you have this very neat uh you know dinner under the stars off the train it's a great picture of it here yeah and this is this is one of my favorite experiences that we offer and i guess this goes to um the core of a lot of what we do is like we really do because Australia, it is quite remote in a lot of the places. So, as a company, we've we've tried to curate these experiences to to really showcase the destinations that we travel through. So people get a real sense of the of the place and the people. And is having having dinner under the stars in an outback uh, outback sheep stations is just one of the ways that we try to really deliver that uh, that authentic Australian experience for our guests. And, and this is the this is a great night. We have um, outback barbecue under the stars. We've got an entertainer on the on the train, so they set up and they they're singing songs and music. And uh, quite often on, towards the end of the night, after after one or two glasses of wine, some people join in with the with the sing-alongs and um, and even a little bit of dancing before we uh, before we get back on the train and, and for the last night of the journey. Beautiful dancing in the outback, and uh, <laughs> even though we don't get much to see of it, but again, as as we were researching this trip, and I was looking at this, Rollinna sheep station is ten thousand square kilometers, basically one farm, that is uh, yeah. that is that is yeah, is simply gigantic in in <laughs> in scale. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a big place, and uh, and this um this little uh, station where we or the side end where we where we pull in was basically um, just built to to so that they could drop supplies off for the uh, for the sheep station because it is so remote it's one of the one of the few ways to get um to get their supplies out there for them yeah amazing amazing so back on the train overnight once again um through the outback uh and then as as we get closer to the west coast i guess the scenery again changing once again we we, we come yeah. into more green exactly um yeah you, you wake up the next morning you've left the desert and you're starting to come back into the uh into the rich farmlands again uh, um, surrounding perth so uh, yeah so uh so it's fantastic and so so it's it's so between adelaide and Perth, it's two more nights on the train. Um, yeah, two nights on the train, Adelaide to Adelaide to Perth. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then and then we pull into Perth, which uh, you know, Perth. I've had the pleasure of visiting Perth. Um, I think it is 
uh, at least from Eastern Canada, it's about the farthest place in the world uh, away from us. So it, it really feels for us like on the other side of the planet. Um, and a remarkable city. You can see it here from the skyline. It's, it's, it's modern, it's vibrant, it has a beautiful harbor, um, lots to do around Perth. Um, again, it's worth spending a few days here. Um, a couple of the highlights around Perth are, are this Rottnest Island. We added this photo in yesterday um, <laughs> yeah. because I had not actually heard of a quokka before. Um, what's the deal yeah. with these happy guys? <laughs> So Rottnest Island is not very big. Um, you can actually ride around it in about two to three hours, depending on how fit you are. Um, but it's home to about 10,000 of these uh, these little quokkas. They're kind of, they're a, they're a marsupial, like a, similar to a, to a kangaroo. They're like a real small fairy kangaroo, but, um, but Huffington Post has labelled them the, the, the world's happiest animal because they always look like they've got a permanent smile on their face. And <laughs> they're really quite, uh, quite friendly. And um, a lot of people, Go over there and they and they get their um, uh, want to get quokka selfies. Uh, so if you if you Google hashtag quokka selfie, there's uh, you'll find hundreds and thousands of photos of, of people having their picture taken with a uh, with a quokka. Brilliant. And people like uh, Roger Federer and uh, and Chris Hemsworth, I guess, there's a couple of the more famous people that have gone over there and uh, and had their had their quokka selfies. But uh, it's one of the most popular day trips um, out of out of Perth. People visiting Perth, a lot of a lot of them will go over to to Rottnest Island. In addition to the quokkas, it's got some spectacular beaches and coastal scenery there. And yeah, the, the pictures on the island. So yeah, um, it's really safe to ride your bike around. Just a really nice uh, nice relaxing day out. We could show so many more pictures, but uh, yeah, the pictures I've seen are really, really picturesque. A little further afield from Perth um, is again, and you know, a few members have commented, I like my wine, that's for sure. Um, Margaret River, a few hours to the south of Perth uh, in Southwest Australia, the very southwesternmost point of yeah. the country is, um, as far as I'm concerned, a must see. Uh, in this part of the country, partly because of uh, the the wines, uh, Western Australian wines, very different in character to the ones in South Australia, mm. but the coastline here, wow! Yeah, it's um, it's it really is a spectacular part of um, part of the country, and yeah, like I say, the Margaret River, I guess historically has been really well known for its Cabernet Sauvignon um, wines, whereas I guess the Barossa is is better known for its uh, its Shiraz. Um, but yeah, Margaret River, there's some spectacular wines. We do showcase some of them on the on the trains as well, just to, mm. I guess, as part of our uh, commitment to prom promoting the regional produce. But um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a spectacular area, and it really is one of those places that offers something for everyone. Whether you want food and wine, whether you want nature and wildlife, whether you want coastal scenery, it, it there is something there that um, that everyone will, will enjoy. That's for sure. That was uh, my experience indeed in Margaret River. Um, so that um, that caps off the rail journeys themselves, but I, I took some time um, sort of uh, uh, working with Mark, sort of sketching out what a program might look like because I thought, wow, there's so much to see. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, you, you, as as Jean pointed out, you might you might want to do more than one rail trip um, on uh, on one journey. And so I was looking at what we might do. Um, so excuse the rough sketch, but um, what were the type of program that we're thinking about um, for for wheel and anchor, and that would probably be in um, uh, in 2022. Uh, is uh, and you'll you'll find it coming up on our trip inspiration survey. But we would probably start off in the very western part. It's a bit of a long flight to get there. Um, maybe we'd stop in Hong Kong or somewhere along the way and fly off to Perth, um, and then uh, spend a couple of days getting to know this area. Um, perhaps uh, doing a, a few days in a pre-tour of, of Margaret River, and then taking the Indian Pacific eastbound out of Perth, um, all the way through the outback through that scenery that Mark was just describing going into Adelaide um, and then spending some days there to visit um, South Australia, which I think is perhaps one of the more underrated parts of the country, except for those that are really into the wine, but there's yeah. so much Unfortunately, else. Unfortunately, you're right there. It's, um, it, it, yeah. the great, and, and some of the great things about getting to, to West Australia and South Australia is that you really do get away from the crowd. So you get a much more intimate experience of the destination. Exactly. And that's really what we're sort of about is, you know, why people come to us at, because as we, we try to go to the spots where, I mean, you know, Sydney is an obvious one. Of course, we'll get there. Everybody goes there. Yeah. But, you know, we like to see the other side of, of these countries and, and the parts that are 
maybe a little bit, a um, little bit more off the beaten track. Um, Adelaide, South, Aust South Australia, Kangaroo Island, I've heard so much about, which is, uh, you can barely see on the map, that little blob of green just off of, uh, off yeah. of Adelaide. Um, you'd have it to really make is a nature lovers there. paradise over there. It's like um, it's often <laughs> referred to as a as a zoo without fences, or or Australia's version of the Galapagos. It's yeah, like, exactly. The wildlife is unbelievable. <laughs> so um, and then uh, so spending some time down in South Australia, and then we'd head up on the Gan to Alice Springs, uh, and spend some days there. From Alice Springs, obviously, is is kind of uh, one way to get into. Um, Uluru, it's only a few hours away, uh, and it's it's hard to say that you've been to Australia and not not seen this magnificent monolith uh, in in the middle of the country, um, and so much else there as well. It's 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 more than just um, some people think it's just the rock in the desert, but um, Kings Canyon, you know, the Aboriginal culture there, uh, it's worthy of spending some time, um, and not to mention yeah. the feeling standing in the middle of Australia, just <laughs> surrounded by. <laughs> It really yeah. would be a, a, a definite highlight of the uh, of the trip, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, yeah, from there, we would probably fly down to Sydney and, and spend a bunch of days in and around Sydney. Uh, and then for those that, that were interested, um, possibly we would tack on a few days as an extension program up to the Whitsundays, uh, which is an island chain that's sort of part of uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the Great Bar Barrier Reef, um, yeah. you know, biosystem. So, um, so that's what a trip to uh, Australia by train could look like. Um, and, uh, but I'd love to have your feedback on that. Uh, and so if you have any thoughts on, uh, on that itinerary, or, or in general about any of the, the programs offered here, of course, as you know, um, we, we are member driven, we love to hear uh, what you think. Is this the type of thing that you would do? Uh, and of course, now it's time for Q and A. Um, and if you don't, if you do have a question that pops up later on, drop us a message. Um, before we get to Q and A, just a reminder: our next webinar will be after uh, the holidays, after the New Year. So we're taking a little bit of a break now for a couple of weeks. Um, January the seventh, we're going to be featuring part four. We're going to be looking at the original luxury rail journey, the Venice Simplon Orient Express, as well as the Palace on Wheels. Um, which is an incredible journey up by train through Rajasthan, India. That's on January the 7th. Uh, and you can find a link to that. Uh, Paula just put it in the chat box. It'll also be in our upcoming newsletters. Um, but I'm sure there must be a few questions. Uh, I, I see a couple that have uh, popped in here. Uh, <clears throat> first question that Paul asked is, uh, how bumpy is the train? Uh, this is a question we always get about the train journey. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, <laughs> I guess you, you can't escape it. It is a, it is a, it is a, a railway track, so it's not, um, it's not perfectly smooth, um, and it, it, it does vary greatly depending on the on the section of track that that people are on. the The GAN line from Alice Springs up to Darwin is a lot newer, so that is that is relatively smooth in terms of in terms of rail. Um, and likewise, the Indian Pacific line from between Adelaide and Perth is is relatively smooth as well. I mean, it's not it's not um, like driving a car or being on a on a boat sort of thing, but um, but it, it, it is relatively smooth. The the section through the Blue Mountains um, that's one of the I guess it, it carries a lot of freight traffic through that section, um, so it's really heavily used that that part of the track. So that's probably the um, the roughest section that we that we go on. So I, that yeah. one that one does get a little bit wobbly going through there, and um, you might notice our uh, our hospitality staff filling coffee cups half full instead of uh, all the way up on that, uh, on that part <laughs> of it. And and for sleeping at night, I always say it's uh, melatonin is a great way to uh, you know help you to nod off if the rocking and rolling is uh, <laughs> is a, is yeah. a bit. Uh, bit much <laughs> yeah melatonin or, or, a, or a glass of red wine if you like uh, or a glass like, of red wine always, well uh, hey we're in australia <laughs> um, we always quite often i mean me personally i always find that um the first night is is a little bit um a little bit rougher but the the second night i always sleep a lot better once i'm um, getting used to the to the motion of the train yeah for sure um just to address a couple other questions here both uh troy and fran were asking us about um, the temperature, the weather, when we'd be considering this trip. 
Um, I think that, you know, we sort of haven't made up our minds on that, but our inclination would be to go to sort of more for the spring or the fall in Australia, which is, of course, the opposite of what it is um, at home in Canada in the Northern Hemisphere. It's um, the what's your best thoughts on that? Year like, in Australia. Yeah, yeah, because this, yeah. the summertime, which is which is our winter, is just simply too hot, I think, in, in Australia. So we'd be leaning to March, April. Um, so possibly March, April of uh, of 2022, or alternatively, I think November is a lovely time to do it as well. Yeah, yeah, that would um, definitely my favourite times of the year. The, the weather is usually perfect. So typically you'd be looking, um, I guess, mid to high 20s in the, in the southern parts of the, the country. So probably it starts to get a little bit warmer in the up around Uluru, but, um, but even so you'd probably be looking in the low 30s around there so not too bad yeah yeah perfect um and uh yeah as i say spring and fall fall is definitely the time to go um yeah. helen a couple of people asked me about um the approximate price for this trip we actually haven't priced it out yet uh because we've just been sort of working out what is the optimal combination of things i mean you know to really see all of australia we'd have to spend a couple of months there um but i think that for the the trip that uh that i just uh alluded to there um which goes from one side to the other um we i think we can probably uh, get that trip for around 10,000 Canadian dollars for the the rail and the land uh, portion of it that's a ballpark guesstimate uh, based on you know me uh, with the on the back of a serviette <laughs> um, that's kind of what we're aiming for is is about that that price point um, um, for that trip uh, then uh, let's see Da, 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 da. The um, um, Gene asked about um, extra trips to Melbourne and Tasmania. Well, this is exactly the issue, Gene, is that, uh, you know, we, um, you know, it's hard to cover all of Australia in one trip. You'd, you'd literally have to be there for weeks and weeks. But for sure, I think Melbourne is worth visiting, as is Tasmania. So we could potentially offer those as, as bolt-ons. So you could go either on your own um, or potentially if, if we had enough interest from our members, we could get a, a small group to go and, and visit those, those places as well. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, again, it's still in the planning stage. Um, we had another question about how long is the flight to Perth from Toronto? Okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's a loaded question, but um, you'd probably, to get to Perth, you'd probably fly from, uh, from Toronto, for example, or Vancouver, for that matter, over to Hong Kong, um, which is about a 15-hour flight. Uh, and then uh, if I was doing it, I always say, take a layover, spend a night, uh, get, get, your, get caught up on the jet lag, uh, and then from Perth, down to, uh, sorry, from Hong Kong down to Perth is, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, that is about another nine, 10 hours, that flight? It'd be about that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, uh, shorter from Vancouver, as Gene points out, <laughs> by a couple hours, but it's a long way, there's no question about it. Um, but as I always say, listen, we're not in a rush to get there. So we just try to structure it so that, you know, make stopovers along the way. Um, you don't have to travel from A to B uh, all in one line. And that's line. one of the great things about rail travel as well, because you, you yeah. after spending a lot of time on the train, um, on a lot of time flying, you can you can sit back and relax on the train to to really get um, get in sync with the uh, in the time zones. For sure. And so, rather than crisscrossing Australia by air, which is the more traditional way to do it. Um, and the faster way to do it, we're not in a hurry here. I mean, that's that's the beauty of train travel, and I think why um, why it, you know it has become so appealing of late. So, um, well, that pretty much wraps us up for today, Mark. I want to take a few minutes and thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, this morning. Well, it's uh, I guess uh, about noon now uh, over there in uh, in Adelaide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Uh, so we, we appreciate it as always. If uh, anybody has any questions at all, once again, please do drop us an email, give me a call. We'd love to chat about it. You'll see this program appear in our trip inspiration survey that's gonna be released, I think this weekend in the newsletter. And uh, thanks for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, if I don't get to speak to you, I wish everyone a wonderful holiday season and uh, we will catch up to you again very soon. And I promise you 2021 is going to look a lot better than 2020 did. We're going to get back to traveling real Cheers soon. Cheers to that. Cheers thanks, to Gordon. that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah.